So I am going to post a link here in the chat that should go to our design module. And on that page, you look down, uh, there's a sample files head. Let me show you right there. So in that zip file, uh, there is a link to my InDesign document, um, all the assets for it, fonts, images, as well as the Word documents that we use to derive this design. So if everyone could go grab that file and then log on to the digital hub, we'll get a look at the next stage. Yes, please, yeah, if we can get just a ready to go or things like that. And we're not gonna need InDesign open just yet. We're just gonna look at the Word document and the hub. There's two aspects of the hub to make sure that it's good to move on and to get a little bit more information about the actual um, thing itself. And I'll just let you know real quick, uh, the sample file that is in your zip file is missing one aspect, but it only pertains to this portion of it. So it won't impact anything else. I just needed to show you guys something in the stack. So I built it into the version that I have. But you'll be able to see what we're looking at on the screen. So we have entered into our record. We have our sample files. And let's say you are the designer, or perhaps you are preparing an IDTT to give to your designer, because that's what they're going to use as the typesetting file. What we want to do is upload the document and then get a look at some tools in the hub that are going to help us with the design stage. This is something I always do every time. And I'll just do that again real quick. I'm going to upload the file. So I'm going to click this little button here, go to the uploads page, and then drag the OTN sample uh, file into this upload. Let's check one thing real quick. Okay. So I'll upload the file. Okay, so this is the first thing we're going to check, is our check. Uh, you know, your file should be green, pretty, good to go. Uh, some issues that you may want to check, if it was orange, for example, or rather yellow, maybe there's mismatched notes, maybe there's non-FBML style, some kind of common links or issues that you may want to, if you're the designer or if you're the project manager and you've received this from an editor, go back to the person and say, hey, I saw this issue. It looks like there are, you know, 14 notes and 13 note references. Can you take a look at this again? We need these to be even. Or maybe, hey, I see there's some non-SCML styles here. That might be something where I'll take the snippet of text that the check is going to give me, look for it in the file, and see if it refers to actual text. You know, did the editor maybe it put in a new paragraph that I sent it back to the author and they put in a new paragraph and it never got composed properly? Those are things I always want to make sure that are resolved before we move on. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the stats. So let's click on this little expand button here. So this is a pretty helpful overview of just what's in the document. You may uh, recall us looking at this before, but now it's kind of important for us to check through in the design phase because we're vetting it for a couple different things. You know, we vetted the file, I guess, really twice before. We looked at uh, vetting the file for composition, which means scrolling through the whole thing identifying how many heads there are, identifying are there sidebars, are, you know, is there something I need to structure a little differently? I think in Karen Bjork's example, we saw these little repeated note elements, and then we had to have a discussion of like, well, is that a regular text, or do we want to treat that as like a box or a sidebar, so that the designer can then pull it out as this new element and get the student's attention a little bit more. We've edited it for editorial purposes, where the notes formatted correctly, um, how how messed up is the text? Again, that's me just being pessimistic, I think. You know, is it in a good condition or is it in need of some help? Um, but, and now we're kind of vetting it for design. So things I want to look at, word count and character count. How big is my book going to be? Uh, right now we're looking at a pretty small example, just as some guidelines for me because we've done the lot. Um, something maybe 10 times the size would be like a novel, you know, in the, 350 to 500,000 character range. Looking at a textbook, you might be a little higher, maybe in the 800,000. Um, so 
you may be more familiar with word count versus character count. At Scribe, we look at each character to get an idea of it. Uh, in some, some designers may be familiar with character count because they may be looking at a character per page count as well. Sometimes, um, and again, I don't expect this to be the case, um, but if you're working with a, a you know, really experienced designer and you kind of know from book production that you want your designer to hit a 2,500 characters per page count or something like that. So that could be something to help you out, just to give us a sense of like, how big is this book? The designer can look at different elements in the book as well. So this just calls out how many of each element is listed. How many heads do I have to account for? I can look at A head and B head. Uh, things that will kind of catch your attention might be, you know, like, oops, there's an equation. There are exercises. Um, there are sidebars. So this is you talking to the designer or you as the designer saying like, well, I have, I have a lot of things to sort of contend with here. If I was looking at, again, a novel or um, something a little bit more simple, I might just see maybe chapter numbers and a bunch of like P and PF and P paragraphs, things like that. It's a lot of body text. What we're looking at here is a lot more new things that we need to account for. And some of this comes more with experience, knowing what these things stand for. Some of it stands for even just looking at the number of things, because in InDesign, we have to define each of these styles in order to properly account for the design. So that's another thing we want to look at, you know, kind of what am I in for as I'm doing this? Are there a lot of things I need to account for? I'm going to collapse that. I'm um, looking at number of images here, how many images are in the book. Here in this, we don't have too many. And now I'm going to bring up my sample document that I've adjusted. So I can show you one other thing. And here I'm just going to repeat the upload process and go back to that stats window. And this is where we should see the thing that is not in the sample document. Nope. nope. Will. <laughs> to my file. I'll give you a sneak peek. What I'm trying to get to is the special characters window. And I can show you exactly what that looks like. I'm not just talking. Well, who knows where that file is? Okay, well. Let's see. I'll just tell you then, because I can't remember which of these files they edited. So there's also in the stats window a list of special characters in your book that may include sort of normal things. By normal things, I mean um, me with a cute accent on it, or you with a umlaut, uh, with an umlaut, things like that that are kind of like common English character phrases. They still pop up here. Same with bullets or uh, M dashes, ellipses characters, kind of like what I would call quote unquote normal or expected things. If I'm the designer and all of a sudden I see Greek text here in a special characters window, or I see again in Karen's uh, example, Arabic characters, now all of a sudden I have to start thinking about and accounting for those special characters because not every font file that you're using will have a glyph to represent those characters. Um, you might have very specialized fonts that you're using for things like sidebars. Maybe it's like a really hip, kind of cool looking typeface you want to use for your chapter titles. Uh, but that might have a really limited number of glyphs built into it. It won't have every single um, what we call character or Unicode character or glyph built into it. So there might be some considerations there. That's something you definitely want to talk to your designer about and say like, hey, just so you know, there's a whole section of Greek text in this book, or there's quoted paragraphs from Hebrew. So now they have to think about, okay, well, I definitely need to account for a method to handle those. There is something built into the hub to handle it, thankfully. It needs to do that. So if I'm going from Word to IDTT, which we're going to do in just a second, I can click my edit settings. And just like with every other uh, conversion we've looked at so far, the different source and destination files are going to give you different options here. So there are a couple defaults, things like convert notes. Um, things like, uh, well, we don't want to articulate that. Things like um, unnesting note heads. And if you have any questions about what these mean, 
There's always these little info boxes. So I'm not concerned about the default at this point, but this might be a very helpful tool. It's a tool called Compose Language Styles, and it does exactly that. It sort of looks for characters outside a certain range. So if you have, you know, English characters are in this range and Hebrew characters are above it. Um, and that's just going by ASCII characters, not something we need to kind of understand at this point. Um, what that will do is it will compare those characters against a database of different languages and apply a language specific style to it. So your Greek characters will now have a character style, um, just like how I is a character style or B for bold. It'll have a certain character style just for that language. So now if you wanted to use that style, you can essentially say anything tagged with this is going to render in Adobe Hebrew. So that now you're not really concerned about that and your designer isn't doing it on a case by case basis. You can use it, the hub and this tool right there to do a wide sweep of checks for these non-English characters and then apply one style to them. So that all the, your designer needs to do is say anything with this style gets this typeface and now everything's gonna render properly. So things like that are some considerations. You know, how many styles, are there any things that I need to communicate to the designer or are there any changes I need to do in my conversion to make sure that everything is accounted for? You know, it's not the end of the world if this doesn't get caught, but if you already know that it's going to be something that comes up in your book and you can know by checking that special characters section in the stats window, then you can account for it and save everybody a whole lot of time. So are there any questions at this point about kind of why we look here or information that we can glean from this before we move on to the conversion portion. So what I was looking at here was we were starting with a word conversion and we were going to IETT and then you click the edit setting. So that's where you would get that. So it's this edit settings button that shows that option. Okay. And at least you need the link or are we good to kind of slow down for a bit? Just let me know. Mine didn't work. Okay. Um, well, for that, I mean, that might be checking your password, resetting the password. So maybe in the, I mean, the break we'll check in. Try that well. Um, well. I can't address that at this point. So maybe we'll talk about that in the break. Okay. Um, so for now, we're just about at an hour. What we're gonna do is we're going to run that conversion. We're gonna take our input document, which is that quote unquote final word document, and we're gonna make it into what the typesetter needs, which is an IDTT document. So now we're just gonna hit, make sure that we're looking at Word. Our output is IDTT. You can see there's a lot of different kinds of output that we can go to from Word, but for now we're concerned about the IDTT file. Um, I'm not gonna change any of the settings. We'll just keep those default. And then I'm just going to hit convert. This conversion is going to generate two files. We're only going to need the one. But basically, it takes it from a Word file, makes it into a SAM file, which is that scribe abbreviated file, the XML file. And it uses that to then convert that to an IETT file. So we're going to download that. We're going to hold on to that for the third session today. That's when we're going to really dive into using InDesign, um, defining style, kind of seeing what the work we've done to up to this point can generate in the design phase. Um, but for now, we're going to hold on to that. I'll show you what this looks like real quick. It's not something that we need to adjust, but just so you know that it's sort of this very specific in design document. Yeah, so it should um, automatically change to the most recent uploaded file. So if you upload a Word file, it should say Word there but you can always just choose word from the available files. I'm gonna show you that basically this is a list of styles in the document, and then it gets into the actual text with the styles applied to it. So very rarely, uh, and certainly not for anything here, do we need to dive into this type of file, but just so you know what that looks like. Um, I don't need that. So for now, uh, I think we're at our hour. So We'll take about a 10 minute break or so. That sounds okay to everybody else.